The amount of times that we've hired terrible CFOs is insane. I really have to learn finance because I'm never letting my business get to this place again. I mean, I remember conducting my first interview for my first ever hire and mm -hmm. Googling what questions should you ask in an interview? Must be detail oriented. Must be a rock star. Nobody reads that and is like, not me. Oh, they want someone with good communication. I better not apply. Yeah. Like that never does anything. This is a big place where people hold themselves back because they're hesitant to bring on the people that they need in order to help them scale. That, if I'm being really honest, just brought up a lot of imposter syndrome of like, who am I to lead people? And what do mm -hmm. I know? If we can change and make great work environments for small businesses, the ripple that you can have is so big. Jackie, welcome to Powerhouse Women. Thank you so much for having me. It always feels so formal when I'm sitting with my real life friends and <gasps> doing the formal podcast host thing, but I'm excited to have you back on the show because we're going to talk today about something that has been a pain point for me. I'm not even going to just say like, oh, a friend. No, me. I am the friend <laughs> of really stepping into this position of being a leader for a team, so a team of people beyond me to help me build this vision. And that's really the world you come from. Mm -hmm. And what's so cool is not only do you have this background in HR and recruiting and hiring in the corporate space, but now you are an entrepreneur as well. So you, you're in our shoes and we need a lot of help. So do I. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Which it's, it's so funny because when I have people, you know, just fill out the information for the podcast, like, Hey, what topics do you want to talk mm -hmm. about? Obviously we know each other. And then there's this one question in there that says, what's something random that people might not know about oh, did you? you? Like what I answered. I, I loved your answer because so Jackie and I have been friends. We're actually friends through Lori. Mm -hmm. That's how we initially met each other. And we were friends for like a couple of years before yeah. it was probably at like a Christmas or Thanksgiving or something. Yeah. Somehow the topic of where we went to college came up and we realized that we both went to this tiny ass college in Wisconsin mm -hmm. that it was what, 10,000 undergrad, like such a small you school. You would know a lot more of the details. Because I was a campus ambassador. <laughs> this is So we're like, how did we realize we went to college at the same school at the same time and never crossed paths? Well, and we basically studied the same thing like same major like, <laughs> but then when we started really so that's perfect because yes I was the one like leading the campus tours I was an RA and you were a year younger than me but we but I did we go had different extra, extra curriculars. I graduated in five you graduated in four so we basically were in the same basically thing but, but yeah. yeah I didn't do any of the fun things so <sighs> we never crossed paths anyway we have to have but yes it's such a small world I was like wait you went to Eau Claire that's wild it's Any wild. other fellow UW Eau Claire blue golds, don't ask us what a blue gold is, but you know, hit so us up man. on Instagram. So here we are now, how many, just a few years later, barely, barely any out of college. And, you know, it's been really cool to watch your journey. And I want to dive in more to your entrepreneurial journey before we dive into the more tactical mm -hmm. that I know I'm excited to learn from you, but it was just a few years ago that you really made that official transition to starting your own business after working for startups. So was that an easy transition for you because you came from the startup world or hmm. was it a little bit of a mindset switch to go from being inside the business to now running it? Oh, there's a lot of things to say there, but I think this is actually my second entrepreneurial journey. And the first time was I was a lot younger and had been in HR and decided I wanted to like follow a passion. And I loved health and wellness. And I decided to become a certified trainer and do like nutrition and wellness stuff. And I f quickly found out like that wasn't really what I wanted to do for mm -hmm. a business. Like so many, and I say that on this show specifically, because I do think that there's a lot of women or people in general who are told do what you love and it won't feel like work. <laughs> follow your passion and like the money will follow. Well, I quickly realized I like working out and being fit for myself, but I don't want to help other people do that. Yeah. You know? And so it wasn't my thing. And that's when I decided to go back into quote unquote, like corporate life, even though it wasn't. So I started working at Lululemon, worked at, at Lululemon for about 
three and a half years um, in leadership roles. And then I transitioned into startups. And when I decided I wanted to get it back into entrepreneurship this time, I looked at it differently and I was like, what could I make them like, what could I charge the most for? Mm. And like building a business and something that I could actually make money and like my skill set that I could make the most money in. And it's been so much more successful. I've had multiple six figure years every year since I've launched because of that. And that never happened with the business that I was like, you know, following my passion. And so I think that, I don't know if that reson- would yeah. resonate with other people, but I, I think like that was such an aha moment for me in this journey, but there's a ton of other mindset stuff that I had to shift from working for somebody else to going to right. myself again. But I think that's advice that I'm starting to give other entrepreneurs. It's like, what can you charge the most money for? Right. It is. It's that blend of like, yes, I think there's a passion element to it because there are days that aren't as fun. There's things for we sure. do that we don't love, but but then what is there an actual market for that mm-hmm. is the path to least resistance? Because the monetization part of a business that makes it different from a hobby is a very real thing. And even if you scale it into something different in the future, it's it's such actually it's actually brilliant advice that I don't think we talk about enough in the early mm-hmm. stages. And throughout that, like I like running a business. Mm. I don't really care necessarily what it is. I mean, I like what I do, so I don't want to like downplay that. But what I've found throughout this journey is I like just running a business. Mm-hmm. Like I think it's very fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and it stretches me in ways that like are just so different from being working for somebody else. And so I think, you know, going back to your first question of like the mindset shift is it took about three years for me to realize that my time is my time <laughs> and I don't have to be online answering slacks and emails from eight to five. Like the fact that we're recording this in the middle of a work day, like that would have caused me so much anxiety for my first two years. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, I planned it and that's in my day. And so I think that was one of the biggest, I mean, that was one of the biggest shifts was like just getting out of the, the nine to five mentality, because the reality is, is I'm working a lot more than nine to five, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And then other times I'm not. And so it's just like figuring out what that is. Yeah. I do remember very distinctly and interestingly to think back for me, because the corporate environment I came from, I'm even using air quotes because I was in outside sales. So I always had full reign over my calendar and what I did day to day. But I knew that there were people who were expecting me to sort of be in work mode. So I'll never forget leaving my corporate job and kind of showing up to the first day of pure just entrepreneurship kind of like, okay, now what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and it is that moment of realizing that there's an, almost an unlearning process as we realize what it takes for each of our individual businesses and what's required, mm-hmm. you know, it totally is. And it's like, this is a little bit of a shift, but like another mindset shift has been like, I now have to do everything, which being a leading HR in a startup, you already kind of were like, I was our office manager. I was our IT person. I was mm-hmm. our HR person. Like I did a lot of stuff that was outside of the normal scope of an HR yeah. role, but like now I'm our business development person and I'm <laughs> our accountant and like learning how to do yeah. other things. I actually just read a book, um, because I'm really focused on business development and learning that as a skill. And I read a, I read a book <laughs> this weekend, cause I'm a nerd and I read an entire book on a weekend called, um, give to grow by Mo Bunnell. And he said that there's a difference between doing the work and winning the work. And so doing the work is like delivering on what you sell, okay. right? Like, so yeah. for me, recruiting talent, like working on different projects. Like I'm really good at doing the work, which is why I've gotten a lot of referrals and like my whole business is referrals. But now I'm kind of to the point where I have to grow up and like start winning business Mm. and like the skills needed to win the work is different. Yeah. And for so long I was like, oh my gosh, like what if I can't do it? And I'm just like, I finally just had this moment where I was like, oh, you just haven't learned it yet. And so I think that's also a shift when you become an entrepreneur is like adding the word yet like when you say you can't do something, it's like, yeah, because you're, you'll learn it. You'll figure it out. You come hell or high water because you're going to have to. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of the perfect setup to talk about this bigger conversation of a role that 
as we grow our companies, we take on, if we really want to scale beyond just being a solopreneur, which there's nothing wrong with that, is whether you consider yourself a leader or not, the moment you start to bring on teams, now mm -hmm. you are a leader. And mm -hmm. I love that your podcast used to be called, oh shit, I'm the boss now. Yeah. <laughs> which the world's best boss is also yes. a great title. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, those office fans out there will yep. really appreciate that. But it really is this moment of realizing the skills that got you to the point that you're at in business where you start to scale and need a team are very different than the skill of not just hiring talent, but knowing how to lead them and develop them. Mm -hmm. So take us into like the perspective you have, because you've worked with huge companies. You have clients that, I mean, span from Aveline Wine, mm -hmm. One Hope Wine. You're working with MeUndies right now, which mm -hmm. I just think that's yeah. just fun in general. And you've been in the startup world, like you said. And what I really would love for you to start to speak to is what is, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see entrepreneurs make as they start to transition into this next phase of growth where they're bringing people into their vision to help them scale? I, I won't say this is the biggest, but a big mistake that I think people think or make is... Hi, like this idea of hire the right people and just like let them go. Mm -hmm. It's like they think if they just hire the best people, their job is done and they can just like tell them what to do and great, their business is solved. And they they think that they can just wipe their hands clean. And some of that, like some of the reasons for doing that are are different. Some is you don't want to be you're you're like too busy. You don't want to be overseeing people's work. Some is you don't want to be perceived as being a micromanager. Others are you don't actually know how to do that person's job. So how can you like oversee it? You know, there's a lot of reasons why. But it, but I think what happens a lot is you just hire people and you assume they're going to tell you if something's not going right or if they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And that's not the case. Like you have to support your your people and support can literally just be checking in on them, you know, overseeing what they're doing, making sure that, you know, you're protecting their bandwidth and not like overworking them or underworking them. Like those are all things you learn mm -hmm. over time. Like I couldn't say, oh, here are pro tips to know you're not overworking your team. It's kind of like you have to have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Like leading a team always comes down to developing a relationship with them. Mm. And I think back to, honestly, the mistakes that I made with some of like my first experience leading a team. I don't even, it's very generous to say that I was leading a team because I was really operating under that approach, not realizing it. And looking back, what one of the things that retroactively I didn't have in place at that time, didn't, because it was a lot of what I didn't know I didn't yeah. know, was having a regular scheduled drop in to like really check on how people were doing and being able to catch things or correct things that maybe just there was people weren't happy or they were over their schedule was overloaded or their task list was overloaded. What is your advice for someone who's looking to who maybe doesn't again, they don't know what they don't know a good structure, like a simple structure to put in place for making sure that you're regularly connecting with and building that relationship so you can get ahead of issues before they even start. Yeah. Scheduling a regular time that you meet with the person weekly or biweekly. And a lot of times someone's like, oh, I don't have time to do that. Yes, you do. Yeah. Um, and it can just be 20 minutes. It can be 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be an hour long meeting, but having a regular time on the books that you and they know that you're going to be meeting to talk about stuff is the most important mm -hmm. thing you can start doing with every single person. And if if you have a big team and you have other leaders, make sure they're doing that with their teams. And a part of your check-in with that leader is asking how their team is doing, you know, and, and digging into that. And the reason why it's so important, I mean, there's so many reasons why this is so important, but the best way to structure a one-on-one -on -one is allow time for you to give that person feedback and give them time to ask for what they need. So like, it doesn't just have to be like, let's pull up your task list and see how things are going. It's more like, what projects are you work on, working on? What roadblocks are you running into that I can help remove? 
How can I better support you in this? Mm -hmm. What training do you need in this? And then there's also time for you to say, hey, Lindsay, I also just wanted to let you know that I was going through the customer service email last week and I noticed a couple emails didn't get responses for like five days. And our, you know, policy is that we respond to people within, I'm making something up. I don't know if this is true for you, but Mm -hmm. you know, this amount of days, like make we like what happened. Right. And then you can have a conversation around it Mm -hmm. so that you're bringing up stuff in a way that doesn't seem so like strict because what happens is like, if you don't have a regular time, this just happened with a, um, a call that I had with a entrepreneur who wanted to fire someone and was worried. And I was like, well, have you told them that they're not doing this right? No. I'm like, okay, why not? And I'm like, do you meet with them regularly? And she said, no. And I was like, okay, why not? And she just said it was because of bandwidth and like all the reasons. And she knew, like, as I started questioning, <laughs> like that shit, I should have been doing Wait, this. It's me. I'm the yeah. villain. <laughs> but if you have a regular time to meet with them, things don't linger on. Yeah. Because if you don't have a regular time scheduled with the person, then all of a sudden two months go by, you're like, shit, this keeps happening. Now I have to randomly schedule a call with them and out of nowhere, like that's going to be awkward. Like it. You just don't have a place in which you can like a time where you can just bring things up in a more casual way and address problems before they become big mm-hmm. problems. So I would say a one-on-one is the most important thing. And you you outlined it. I'm going to just ask you to reiterate because I think this is something I wish I would have heard someone share in a podcast, a simple structure for that one-on-one. You gave like some really key questions. Yeah. Let's just reiterate that. What would be the ideal structure for one-on-one meetings if someone is just starting to put this in place? What are like the four to five best questions to go in, having your team know that those are going to be the questions and you having a template for it? Yeah, I would say first asking like what's going well, what uh, roadblocks are you facing that I can help with? The third question would be, and I actually just heard somebody, uh, I read that somebody started doing this and so I'm going to add it in We're there. We're stealing it. I wish I could remember <laughs> who it was to give them credit, but it was like on a scale of one to 10, what's your workload feel like? Ooh, yeah. Um, because then you can like keep a pulse on that. Um, mm-hmm. And then have them answer those questions before you go. So like they're prepping for the one-on-one and then you also provide space for any feedback that you have to give to them. I don't know that you have to necessarily write that down. Although I do think there's value in having a shared document that all of this stuff just lives so that there's documentation of what was discussed, but that some companies that works well, some don't, but it would be what's going well, what roadblocks are you facing? Like on a scale of one to 10, like 10 being completely overwhelmed, like where, where's, what's your workload at? And then the, the the other piece would be giving them feedback. Giving any feedback. Yeah. Okay. That is so helpful. I mean, that alone is worth the price of admission because I think just having that structure to follow, thinking about how much that would have served me in my first months slash years as a boss, right? would have made things so much simpler. So kind of continuing on that theme of what we don't know, we don't know as entrepreneurs. From your perspective, working in HR, from your perspective, supporting entrepreneurs now in their Mm -hmm. HR departments, what are some of the, the most commonly missed things that we don't even know we don't know? I would say HR, understanding core laws that you have to follow, like the the legal side of it. Which I always feel so boring when I say that. Well, maybe add some like jazzy music <laughs> I don't know in the background. <laughs> right. And so like, I'm not an employment attorney, but so much of HR stuff is also educating on employment laws. And there's not as many. I don't like, I think people think there's a ton and there's really not that many, mm. but there's some that are really important that you know, and it's making sure that you're classifying your your workers correctly, understanding what the law dictates is a contractor versus an employee. Mm -hmm. And explain the difference. If someone's never hired a single person, what the difference of a contractor versus an an employee is. I kind of want to like talk about it from the government perspective. So like an employee is somebody who is 
I'm going to say employed because I can't think of another word, but essentially you as the business have to withhold certain payroll taxes from that person's paycheck. And you also have to pay in taxes to the state and the government for paying, having this person work in your business. Mm -hmm. They also get more protections from different laws that are in place. A contractor is somebody who really just like does project work for you. Um, you don't have to pay taxes. You just pay them as an entity and that contractor is responsible for paying their own self-employment taxes, right. essentially. Right. So if you look at it that way, the government wants their money. So almost everybody's probably, by the law, an employee. Like a lot of employment attorneys are like, workers are considered employees until proven otherwise. Mm. And I think that entrepreneurs look at that the opposite. Mm. They think that everybody's a contractor until they're working full time. Mm. Mm -hmm. And full time means they're an employee. And that's not actually the case. Um, I have an entire podcast about the difference between contractors and employees and we'll link your podcast so i think it'd be best if i could do a whole episode on that which Great. i won't we'll make sure we'll um, make sure that gets linked but i think like thinking about it from that lens mm -hmm. of like the government wants their money and then the second piece to that is once you've determined that an employee is an employee there's two types of classifications that they fall into an exempt employee and a non-exempt employee an exempt employee means that they are not eligible for overtime, typically paid a salary. And they also get additional, there's additional laws that they're covered. Like they get certain meals and rest breaks. Like there's other laws that protect them. And a lot of times people don't realize that to be considered an exempt employee, your, the scope of your job duties have to meet certain criteria. So again, employment attorneys often say like, an employee is non-exempt until proven otherwise. And most of the time, entrepreneurs think the opposite. They're like, oh, I'm hiring them as an employee. I'm going to pay them a salary and we're good. But there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. And again, I have entire podcast episodes about this, so I won't <laughs> go into them. But there's two things that keep in mind if you're wanting to pay somebody a salary is you have to pay them a certain amount and their job duties have to like match. And so... The federal, a big law just went into effect in July that increased the minimum salary you have to pay somebody to consider them exempt from overtime. And it's now up to $43,000, $43,888. California, to pay someone a salary, they have to earn at least $65,000. So it's like people don't realize that. And so I'll go in and I'll do an audit for a small business and they've been paying somebody $30,000 on salary, violating the law without knowing and, you know, I've mentioned it and they're like, well, why didn't my accountant tell me? Mm. Well, because your accountant's not a not trained in HR. Like, mm. I don't give you like G&L advice. Like, I'm not an accountant, you know. Um, and th I think a lot of times entrepreneurs just think an accountant will catch it. Yeah. And they don't they're not trained. in Some will. But a lot of them are not trained in that stuff. Mm. And it's like it, it's <laughs> going back to the whole start of the question. What we don't know, we don't know. And part of what we don't know, we don't know is even who we need in our corner, especially as a small business, a startup mm -hmm. entrepreneur, in order to make sure that we're building the foundation on a solid foundation from the start. So if you were to help someone kind of put together that dream team of who they should just have kind of like in their ear, whether it's via a podcast like yours, what are the pieces where you see, and this is a perfect example of where people are maybe assuming, I'm thinking too, like my bookkeeper is a CPA by trade, but I ask my actual tax questions to my CPA who does my taxes and mm -hmm. is more actually up to speed on what exemptions, et cetera, are available. So I have two separate people, one who does my books and then one who actually advises me on tax strategy. Yep. They're both CPAs on paper, but it's two very different roles, right? Yep. I mean, I think account like CPAs for like having that mm -hmm. in your corner, having like a, a CFO yeah. or somebody who can help with like f financial planning, having an HR person that you can go to and ask questions like just to the ran the random questions that you don't realize you need. Like how many times have you texted me and you're like, can I pay you for this? I'm like, no, I'm just going to tell you what to do. But like <laughs> um, also offer to pay uh, your yeah, friends. Totally. But even but. 
from there, they can say no. <laughs> Finding somebody who can help you with some mm-hmm. of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think there's a miss in um, options for small businesses for yeah. HR advice. There are some HR services bundled into like payroll services. So like if you use like ADP payroll or something like sure. that, they yeah. sell you that you get HR advice, but you don't actually get <laughs> HR advice. You get a help desk answer mm. of exactly the law and like it, everything is no. Like, you know, like when you think of HR, you're like, oh, the answer is no, no fun. We can't do anything. Like that's kind of what you get is like, it's always no. Don't do that. That's yeah. the answer. And I think the difference is like, there's a lot of gray in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I always have looked at it as like, my job is to educate my CEO who I'm working for or my clients on why they're making the decisions and what the risk is. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you might decide that the penalty for getting caught isn't as big of a deal as like the benefits that you're getting, right? So it's like weighing the risk. But I think as a small business owner, you don't even have anybody doing that for you. And and that is where I think it's a lot of a miss in that you don't have that. Because sometimes I'll get on the phone with some with a client and, I'll, and they'll tell me stuff. I'm like, I mean, technically it should probably be this, but I think the risk is pretty low that you're ever going to have this happen that Mm. I don't know that I would make, I don't know that I would worry about it until you get to X amount or Mm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, because so much of HR stuff is it depends. And so having somebody that you can actually like talk to about it and Mm. your specific business is so important. And then I think an employment attorney in the state that you operate and having somebody like that, that you can talk to because I can provide you know, guidance and support, but I'm also not an attorney. So it's like, I think those are, that's the last one that I think you should have. If nothing else, just for your own peace of mind to know that yeah. you're operating within the best of your ability within the law. Yeah. Maybe that's the rule follower in me that <laughs> has fear of breaking laws or, or just not even realizing, like I said, like what I don't know, I don't know that I'm not setting it up correctly from the beginning. Well, I just think like, There's so many parts of business that we just decide we don't want to learn about and we'll like put it off. I just think as my own personal entrepreneur journey and as I follow mentors who've built really big businesses, all the good ones know how to do everything in their business. Mm -hmm. They're not just saying, oh, I didn't learn about this because I don't, I'm not good at it or Mm -hmm. like. You know, they don't just not learn about stuff Mm. and they, they know how it doesn't mean they're doing everything in their business, but they know enough about it to have an opinion on it. And I think, you know, a lot of times in business, we're like, well, I'm just not good at finance. I'll hire a CFO. Mm -hmm. The amount of times that I have had client, like worked in businesses that we've hired terrible CFOs and I've had to clean up messes from CFOs is insane. And then that's the lesson that the C like the CEO learns is like, shit, I really have to learn finance because I'm never letting my business get to to this place again. Mm -hmm. And that can also happen with the HR side of your business is like all of a sudden you get a lawsuit filed by a former worker of yours. And it is this cascading event. Like there's never this moment in the HR side of your business where you're like, oh, now I got to take it seriously. The moment is like a lawsuit or something bad that then it always looks backwards you don't, you don't get an option to fix it. Like it always looks backwards, Mm, you know? Gosh, that's so true. So I kind of took us on a little bit of a tangent when we were going down on a tangent too. the road, we'll just bring the plane back on course of the, just the things that we don't even know that we don't know. If there's any others that even just someone hearing it today, it's going to plant the little seed that they should learn about that. At least now there's awareness. Yeah. I would say, I mean, the compliance piece for sure. And there's a whole bunch of other laws that you need to know. So I would say research where you have employees and like the laws that impact Mm -hmm. those locations Mm -hmm. is the most important. And there's a bunch of them for different things. I think another very basic thing that you don't often know is that just because your business is in Arizona, if you have employees in New York, you have to follow New York laws. So like you have to know the laws of wherever you have employees. Mm -hmm. Um, is a big thing that you don't Mm -hmm. know how to hire people. I mean, that's a whole nother thing is, you know, you, there's a process and, and making sure that you have a pre-planned 
way in which you're going to hire people, what you're going to look for, what you're going to ask, like being very intentional about that and not just hiring somebody and thinking you're going to figure it out. Mm. Where are, I mean, other than of course your company, your podcast before you existed, what resources exist for small businesses to really learn this other than I guess Google? Yeah. I mean, I remember telling you that I, remember conducting my first interview for my first ever hire and Mm -hmm. Googling what questions should you ask in an interview? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Onboarding policies. Because I, I've actually never had like a traditional corporate job. I've never gone through that as an employee. So I didn't even back in the category of what I didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, there's Google. There's ChatGPT now. Thank goodness. There's at least that. I mean, it's a little bit better, but it's still not great. Yeah. Now there's so many. I mean, now there's Google, there's ChatGPT, there's books, there's other podcasts. You know, if I'm being really honest, I didn't even learn. I didn't have one class about how to hire people Mm. in my my undergrad or my MBA. So even I'm hopeful that they're teaching that now. But like I I had to learn all on my on my own, too. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone is, let's say, making their first hire or they're getting back out there and maybe the first hire didn't go as well and they want to really refine their hiring skills, what are some of the biggest tips you can give in that process that you're saying we should have? (laughs) So I'm like, yeah, I totally have a process. Of course I do. (laughs) I just get it really quick. But what are some of your tips either for the hiring process, the onboarding process? Again, we're, I want to leave people with these very tangible takeaways, whether they need them right now or they're going to remember to come back to this episode in six months when they're making a hire. I just think this this is a big place where people hold themselves back because they're hesitant to bring on the people that they need in order to help them scale. Mm-hmm. I would say the process is maybe the pro- maybe the word process isn't the right word. I think it's just being intent, like taking the time to intentionally look at your business and what you need help with to map out what it is that you actually need this person to do. And then taking the time to think about what are the skills, like the most important skills that the person should have to be able to execute those tasks. Mm -hmm. And then taking the time to think about what are the three to five I'm going to call it core values. And I, I hesitate because I hate that word. Like I hate that word, but I don't know another word for it. But like, what are the three to five non-negotiable values, characteristics that you want every single person on your team to have? More like the, their personality yes. and like their character. Exactly. So true. Cause like, it's so much more than just the tasks they can and it's complete. Like three to five for everyone, mm-hmm. no matter what their job is. And like, I like to look at them and my old co-founder said this, like, these are things we're not really willing to teach. Like kind of just have to yeah. have them and really think about that. And it's like remembering that going slow helps you go fast Because what happens is you're so overwhelmed, you've waited too long, you post, you Google job description for blah, 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 blah. You copy and paste, you post it, you start getting applicants, you start talking to people like, oh, I like you. Okay, great. Start. Um, And then you're filtering like, oh, they didn't work. Shocker. You know, because you didn't do the time up front to get clear on what it was you needed. And the better, the more often you go slow and dial that in before you go out looking for people, the more likely you'll make better hiring decisions. Mm. What are some of the things you've learned about that initial job description that we can put in? Like, do you put those values that you're looking for right in the description that people are reading when they submit an application? Is that something you disclose right up front? Like how much of that should we include of the company culture or the things that matter most to you? Mm -hmm. I love that question. I think that job descriptions should no longer be used. And I really, yeah, I think we should get rid of that term. And I think there should actually be two documents for lack of a better word, an internal job index or whatever matrix, whatever you want to call it. And it's a list of what is this person responsible for in my business? What are the metrics that they're held up, held accountable to? Like, what are they doing in my business? What are the, like, 
And then like, how should they be to indicate that they're doing a good job? Mm. You know, like writing that out and then your core values. And then that's almost like a rubric of like, you give that person to, to, you give this to them on their first day and you're like, this is what you're responsible for. This is how I expect you to behave and act and get the work done. And then you can use that as like a performance review too, Mm. right? And then there's the external job ad that you like, think about it as an ad that you are like marketing copy. Like you want that to read as like, they're reading that and they're like, I can't fucking wait to work at Powerhouse Mm. because I know exactly who they're looking for. I embody all these core values. I want to be surrounded with other people who have these. Yeah. These day-to-day tasks look fun. Oh, I get to accomplish this. That's cool. You know, but like, it, just writing out a laundry list of like, must be detail oriented, you know, must be a rock star. Nobody reads that. And it's like, not me. <laughs> like, wait, I am a rock star. Yeah. Like everybody thinks I self-identify exactly. as a rock star. I have great communication. That's of course so I'll apply. True. But nobody's like, oh, they want someone with good communication. I better not apply. Yeah. Like that never does anything. Yeah. So I think there should actually be like those two different things. How do you put verbiage in there that weeds out the people? Because like you're saying, okay, so everyone's going to self-identify as Mm -hmm. goal-oriented and all these things that are just this jargon. Are there any secret things you kind of weed into that, Mm -hmm. even just that job ad or the hiring process that can help you determine and quickly identify who should move forward in the process and who shouldn't? I want my answer to be yes. <laughs> no secrets? I really want oh. it to be yes. I would make so much money <laughs> if my answer was yes. I guess it depends on the role too. It just depends. And it mm-hmm. depends on your company. Mm-hmm. Like if you have a really strong brand, like you're automatically weeding people out. Like I think about like Layla Hormozzi, for example. One of her Ask Me Anythings was like, somebody asked her like, does the sales job really have to be in person? And like she responded And she said something to the effect of like, it does. And if you're going to say, if you, if you're going to give me a list of reasons why you can't work out of our office, I have a whole team that shows otherwise, like people who really want something are willing to do it. And if you don't like this answer, you're going to hate working for me. Like, I mean, but that's true, right? Like, that's how you need to be kind of with your brand. Like, of course she's different because she has a big following and stuff like that. But it's like, the more you can just be very real out there, the more people are going to like, be like, not for me. I don't know if that really answered your question, but just being like very forthcoming. Um, I think core values can turn people away if they're written very well. So like, I don't know if... If listeners have ever heard of like Netflix's Netflix's culture deck, it's all about like, we are a team. We are not a family. And like, Mm -hmm. sometimes team members get cut because they're not doing a good job. And like, sometimes there's, there's no longer a fit for this person on the team. Like we work hard, we reward great behavior, but sometimes you're just get cut. Yeah. And it's like somebody who reads that, who loves that, like would opt in somebody would be like, Oh, I don't want to work there. You know? So it's like the more you can make those things that are really unique to you stand out, the more the wrong people won't apply, but that just takes time. Like there's not any certain phrase I can tell a listener to put in. I feel like what I'm taking away from that though, is the honing in on the authenticity of your brand and the culture you want to create internally, which spills over into your brand, Mm -hmm. the the customer experience. That's so good. So the only other piece we really haven't touched on is then the leadership side. And I know this also could be its own 12 part podcast Mm -hmm. series, but what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned either managing teams yourself as the leader or seeing again, the mistakes or the learning on the job of, of leaders you've witnessed or, or supported of just some of the things that you see people could easily shift and get better outcomes from the team that they're working with. I would say the the best place that I ever learned leadership was at Lululemon. I mean, and I, I have, that's another connection that we have, like their culture. And I wasn't even there as a staff member, but I was one of their ambassadors and got to a little bit of an inside view. It's, it's a, if you want to study company culture, they really, they develop leaders really well. 
and I think that it's changed now because it's been 10 years. But Mm -hmm. when I worked there, there was this thing called the practice of leadership. And there was three different levels. There was leading self, leading others, and then leading organization. Mm. And as you moved into different roles, you kind of had to take on additional skills that you had to learn. So like leading self was all about being a leader for your own life, like taking personal responsibility for yourself, you know, having great communication, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And then once you started leading other people, then you moved into leading others, but you still had to work on, you still had to have the leading self. Right. And then you just had this other layer of things to add on. And those were things like giving feedback, delegating work, setting expectations, those types of things. And then as you got into managing a store, then you were like, leading organization, which was like, how do you help the, how do you get results through others? How do you, you know, drive results? And Mm -hmm. so I think thinking about your role as a CEO in that way, I think is just powerful in and of itself. Um, because I think if you're an entrepreneur, you're probably most likely doing a really good job of leading yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, doing the personal development, but you probably don't have some of those skills of leading others. And so starting to work on being good at delegating, how to set expectations, how to make decisions, how to give feedback is really important. And I love that Lululemon said it's a practice of leadership because it's a practice. You're going to always be evolving and getting better at it. And you're going to make mistakes. What are some of the best tools, resources, books, or, you know, podcasts, again, we'll just keep plugging your podcast, but for those who really want to hone in on this skill of leadership at any of those three Mm -hmm. levels, what are some of your highest recommendations? Definitely recommend Radical Candor. Mm -hmm. Um, One of my favorites about how to give feedback and just how to like have relationships with your team Mm -hmm. and how important that is. The making of a manager is a really good one. She was an intern at Facebook. And Whoa. worked her way up to being the VP of design. Wow. And she talks about all of her lessons and learning how to be a boss. It's a great book. So it's called Making of a Manager. And then, I mean, I have a friend who has an amazing Manager 101 course. Um, her name is um, Ashley Hurd. It's called Manager Method. It's a virtual course. And it she's like... <laughs> very popular on TikTok. So all of her videos are like TikTok videos, Oh, but no they're way. so relatable. And she used to be an employment attorney. And actually we can link it down below too, but that's a great like course to take. That's really inexpensive that I think you would learn really great manager course, um, just skills. Mm, and a plug for world's greatest boss. Yes. World's greatest boss. Okay. I, w- I go back and forth between best or greatest, but really the proper way to say it is world's greatest boss. If for you know sure. the, the, the mug that we're referring to, then you can be our friend. Yep. So For people who are listening to this, and I just remember so many of our previous conversations as I would ask you these questions and you would fill me in on what I needed to know. And I started to, my eyes started to glaze over because I realized it just wasn't my skill set. I just, in that very moment, was so grateful that I have access to you and that you're doing the work that you're doing. So tell us a little bit about the services that your firm provides now, because I do think it's just such a unique way to meet entrepreneurs where they're at. And there's different ways that people can really be supported, especially if they have teams growing to like 10 plus employees and it's starting to be a little bit more logistically challenging. Yes. Well, thank you for that. My firm is called People Principles, and we have a recruiting arm and we have an HR services arm. And recruiting is for larger companies, um, scaling, probably hiring like five to 10 people. So there's a whole recruiting support that we provide. But I think for context of this conversation that we just had, Mm -hmm. um, our HR service is a really great option for smaller entrepreneurs who are like, you know, 10 people or feeling like you're going to quickly get to 10 employees because employees is where more laws and complications get into to mm-hmm, play. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really excited about it because it's a very affordable way to get expert HR advice, like on demand. It's actually our HR on demand program and clients can 
they get their own Slack channel with us where we voice note, we send documents. Like you can ask a question um, at any time. We respond within two hours. And then we do also have weekly office hours where you can book a 30 minute call if there's like a really tricky situation going on with an employee or, or something like that. And I think what's been so fun about it is we're also kind of like your cheerleader because I do mm. think you as a CEO, like you don't have anybody in your corner yeah. when you're like feeling down about how a conversation went with an employee mm. or like feeling a little down on your skill set. And so a lot of times they'll like talk to us about it and we'll be like, you did great. Or like, yeah, you probably could have refined this, but that's okay. You're learning, you know, and Here's it's just you like, did well. Yeah. It's just yeah. like having a cheerleader too. Gosh. So like not even just having expert advice, but like having somebody who's not going to shame you if you do something wrong is what we do. And mm. so, um, all, everything there is over at peopleprinciples.co forward slash on demand. Mm. And we'll make sure to link everything in the show notes. So number one, just thank you for the mm. wealth of knowledge you've been for me in this journey. And I love now that there is a way that people who aren't personal friends with you who find out they accidentally <laughs> find out they went to college with you can, can have access to this because, what I want to speak to is just how empowering it's been for me as a business owner, because I do know I have a big vision that is going to require support. Mm -hmm. And that, if I'm being really honest, just that overwhelmed me. It intimidated me. It brought up a lot of imposter syndrome of like, who am I to, to lead people and what do mm -hmm. I know? So when we think about world's greatest boss, what do you want to speak to? Like if you're all of our cheerleaders right now, what do you want to speak to in all of us to encourage us that we actually do have more of the skills than maybe we realize in being a leader, maybe even being the world's greatest boss to our team that we're leading? I think as a small business, you have the ability to be so agile and you get a What I love about working with people like you is like I give you advice and you go do it. Mm. And you have the ability just to go implement it. And you don't have a bunch of red tape that you have to, mm. of approvals you have to go. And you can try it. And if it didn't work, try it a different way. And so I just think there's so much value in knowing that you get to just figure it out as you go. I know that, I don't know if that's empowering or disempowering, but I think like there's been a lot of times where I work in bigger companies. Mm to do any sort of great thing for an employee requires so much approval that it's like, I almost don't even want to recommend it. Yeah. Right. And so I think there's power in being a small business that you get to just go and implement stuff very quickly. Mm. And most entrepreneurs like value freedom and like a good working environment. And so you have the ability to provide that to other like there's just a ripple effect, I guess, is what I want to say. It's like, you know, if if we can change and make great work environments for small businesses, like the ripple that you can have is so big because it's I think it's like 80 percent of people work for small businesses. So if small businesses can be a great place to work, like imagine the impact that has on families. Mm, that's so beautiful because like we've all worked jobs we hated and it affects my personal life. Right? I think you going to say it affects my personality, which it does also. Well, that too. And my personal life. But it's life. just like yeah. the majority of people work for small businesses. And if we can make them great places to work, like it just would really affect a lot of stuff. Yeah. I love that. So we'll link everything in the show notes where people can learn from you, get the support mm -hmm. that they need. So I want to kind of wrap it up with reflecting on this journey that you've had and whether it's the journey of growing your business. I know you also have been in a season of a lot of personal growth and we've, we haven't actually properly <laughs> caught up on that. We'll get yeah. to do that hopefully this weekend on a hike, but we end every episode with this question of just an opportunity for the guest to acknowledge themselves mm. for something big or small that they've accomplished or just say they, they haven't paused to say, you know what? I really didn't take the time to acknowledge myself for that. We just call it a powerhouse moment. Okay. It can be anything big or small. Usually I tell people like, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say, what is a recent powerhouse moment that you <sighs> want to celebrate publicly right now? I think when you're growing a business, you can get so caught up in growing the business and avoid other aspects of your life that you need to focus on. And so I would say I'm going through a hard season where I'm like reevaluating a lot of stuff yeah. and it's scary. And it's easier just to focus on building the business because it's distracting. And I would, I haven't been doing that. So 
I'm really proud of myself for doing some of the the inner work and yeah. that I've been avoiding as I've been trying to grow a business. It's so easy to do that, mm-hmm. but you can't outrun it forever. Mm-mm. Yeah. And it is hard. So anyone going through a hard season while also growing a business, I see you. It is hard. And we'll get through it. We you always know? do. Yeah. Mm. So hard. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.